complicate things, these plots in this field divide up again in the middle with a line of trees because it's agroforestry. So we're doing agroforestry here where we've got trees every 23 meters to improve the biodiversity. So in here we have two plots is one year of the rotation. And if you go to your plan, if you go to year one and year two, that's what we're looking at now. So the start, you know, beginning of our rotation is a fertility building green manure crop. This crop last year was actually squash into which this was sown and you'll see that down your end of the field we've got squash growing and this was under sown into the squash and the reason we do that is to extend the green manure period so what we're looking at over the whole rotation is how much land we can keep covered for as long as possible yeah. and i work it out in a number of weeks per year i can't remember what it is it's on there it tells you um, we manage more than half it's about 60 percent of all the ground is covered in any one time. So over the course of the whole rotation we've got more than a half of it is in green manure but we're also growing crops as well because we have green manure under crops and we have green manure after crops. So the idea is to try and keep the ground covered as much as possible because in nature you never have bare soil, it's always covered. And the only time we have bare soil is to get a crop established which we do in a relatively short space of time. We keep the weeds down for maybe six or eight weeks and then we either put a green manure crop in or we allow the weeds to grow. And this is really important, keeping the ground covered. So the whole rotation really is designed as far as possible to enable ground to be kept covered, but also to enable us to crop as much as possible. So we're cropping more than 65% of the land is actually producing crop in any one year. So we've got cropping areas, which is exploitive, and we've got fertility building areas, which is regenerative. And we have to balance that up. And the idea is that we are putting back at least as much as we're taking out in terms of carbon, uh, nutrients, minerals. And that's really important because we're taking more out than we're putting back, it's not sustainable. Now we've got records going back right to the beginning of when we started here 34 years ago and I know what our soil was in those days in terms of nutrients, I know what the organic matter was. So we can now compare it um, you know, with 33 years ago, we can see a very clear picture of where we were then and where we are now. And the encouraging part of those soil analysis is we have now got more organic matter, so we've got higher carbon rates than when we started. We have higher phosphate, we have higher potash. Uh, the pH has more or less stayed the same. It did drop initially, but it's now more or less the same. And all the trace elements which we did analyze have also stayed the same. So we haven't lost, as far as we know, we haven't lost anything in terms of nutrients from this field, despite the fact that we've been cropping it for 33 years. So we've been in a huge offtake of food, you know, 20, 100 and, 20, 140 tonnes a year is getting sold from here. We're not getting that nutrient back, but we're still able to see a, a replenishment of nutrient because of the way we manage the soil. And the green manures are really the most important part of that because they're bringing up nutrients from down below. Mm -hmm. They're fixing nitrogen from the air. They're producing carbon in, in the fibre of the plant. And they're encouraging the biodiversity of the soil. And I've told you about the biodiversity of all the green manures and the beetle banks, but also there's the biodiversity of the soil and that biodiversity is made up of bacteria and fungi. The more plants you have, the greater the species, number of species of different types of plants in any piece of ground, the more bacteria and fungi you encourage. Every plant has its own relationship with thousands of different bacteria and fungi. So, and they're very specific, you know, bacteria and fungi will only live on one particular plant, one particular weed. So the greater the diversity of plants, the greater you encourage this diversity of fungi and bacteria. A lot of those fungi and bacteria are responsible for making nutrients available, for mobilising nutrients, even breaking down rock material to allow the nutrients to dissolve. So they're an essential part of the soil, and this is the, the part of the soil which everybody forgot about until recently. Everybody thought about the chemistry, nitrogen, phosphate, potash, but nobody, nobody apart from one or two wacky scientists and a few crazy organic growers like myself ever talked about biology of soil because we didn't actually know anything about it. We talked about biology, we didn't know anything about it, you know? But now we're getting a much clearer picture of what's happening in soil. Lay out. He's <laughs> Japanese. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope they're not running through our cabbages. <laughs> um, I found quite over there. Yeah. It? So this biology, you know, this biodiversity is not just about the things you can see like the earthworms and the predatory wasps and the beetles and the wasps and the flies and all those things it's also about all the stuff you can't see tiny tiny microbes in soil little nematodes you know fungi things which are often invisible to naked eye this is the important part of what we do which is a biological 
functioning of the whole system. And this is how we maintain nutrient levels, but we have to manage it in the right way. And the green manures are really a big part of that, which is why we have this elaborate rotation. It's to allow as much as possible of our land to be grown green manures, to be regenerative rather than exploitive. I mean, we could have it all in green manures. The trouble is we can't eat green manures. We still need to produce crops. So we're trying to strike a balance here between what we need in terms of fertility building and long-term soil improvement because what we've taken on here is soil which has been seriously ravaged and raped in the past thousand years. It's been exploited and exploited and a lot of it's been lost. We've had to rebuild some of that loss. So we're at a point in time when the soil is in a very poor condition despite the fact it had been organic before we came here it hadn't been improved at all it was still in very in, it was very infertile soil this is grade three land this is not horticultural land at all it's no conventional horticulturist would even look at this they would laugh at this you can't grow stuff in here this is building rubble you know um, so we've had to improve what is actually a, a, a pretty poor soil and make it fertile but even poor soils can be fertile Okay, it's inherently poor, it's stony and it's, it's not that great, but it can be made fertile and that's what we've done over quite a long period of time. I mean, knowing what I know now, I could do it much quicker. This has been quite a learning curve. Um, but we're at a point now where I'm really confident in the soil. It's, 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 it's capable of producing a range of different crops of reasonable quality of, of quite decent yields, in, in some cases in very high yields compared with conventional, as, as good as conventional crops. So we're quite happy it's been working. And the rotation is really a key part of that. And what you're looking at here is the green manure which went into the... This was only sown a year ago. In fact, a year ago this week. Uh, it's been cut only once. Um, there's a lot of wildflowers here. You can still see some of them popping some things, but there was 20-odd different wildflowers sown in here. But what you will see is a lot of chicory. And the chicory is there for a reason, because it's really deep-rooted. It's really good at exploiting minerals. It gets into the subsoil. It breaks up the subsoil. It allows as the plant dies, which it will eventually, the channel it leaves is a really good exit for earthworms to move up and down, for water to move. You know, the root is an essential part of the soil. So the green manure is not, what you see above the ground is a pretty bit. The bit you see below the ground, which is the bulk of it, the biomass, the real biomass of green manure is below the ground, not above it. Hundreds of thousands of little root hairs. If you add them, if you space them all out, I don't know if somebody works out, you know, it's from here to the moon and back or something, like half an acre. I mean, it's a ridiculous number of, of linear meters in one plant. So that's all part of the whole system. So what we're looking at really is detail, incredible detail. And I don't understand half of it. I just know it happens. You know, this biological activity in the soil is what drives our system. And it's the biodiversity in both the soil and above the ground that drives that. So biodiversity is the key, it really is. Uh, and this is something we've only learnt in the last few decades, really. I mean, you know, most farmers, a lot of them still haven't learnt it. You know, they're still trying to get to grips with this idea of biodiversity. What, biodiversity, that means weeds? Yeah, you have, you have to let some weeds grow, you know, because they're important in terms of bringing in the right sort of biological activity. So this is just a part of the rotation. So the next two plots were all in squash last year. Um, it's looking really nice at the minute. I mean, I don't want to mow it just yet until the flowers are finished, but when the flowers are done, it will get mown. I don't care about these flowers setting seed. I, I'm not, I have no paranoia about seed bank at all because we've got millions of seeds every square meter already. And what we're doing, <laughs> we're introducing some of the weeds that would have been here. So part of this mix is actually also a flower mix. So we're reintroducing wildflowers, which would have been here in, in previous arable systems and been driven out by, mostly by cultivations rather than by, um, by herbicides because this has been organic for a very long time. I can hear a gate going over there. Yes. Mm. Did you check? Yeah, it's a castle. Yeah. We'll move on. I think there's castle coming into the This is just one of, one of many species. And this is uh, sweet clover. Uh, it's, it's hugely productive. It has a most beautiful smell to it. It makes lovely honey, apparently. Um, very deep, very deep rooting, very extensive rooting. But every one of these plants, and this is this is lucerne, and then you can't see where but down there is red clover and white clover. They all have different flowering periods, and when this is cut, the others come on. You can see red clover. They've all got a different root systems. They're all doing different things in the soil. You know, this one's really deep. This one's much more extensive. They're exploiting different soil levels and encouraging the bacteria and the fungi live on this 
don't live on this one. Well, they might, they might share, but they'd have, this would have separate bacteria and fungi to that. This one may have bacteria and fungi which only live on this plant and no other plant anywhere in the world. You know, this is how specific they are. And, you know, the biological investigation of what goes on in soil has only just started to look at that. You know, the, the interactions and the possible combinations of different bacteria and fungi are mind-boggling. You know, we couldn't imagine the figures. It's just too much to think about. So every plant has a purpose. But, I mean, they're also very beautiful. <laughs> you know, you can see why insects want to come and hang out here. You know, our farm is very popular with insects, and there's a reason for that. But it's not just about the way we manage the green manure. It's the way we manage the hedgerows, the field margins, the beetle bank. All this is part of the whole system approach to pest disease control and this enhancement of biological diversity. And, you know, I keep on about it, but it is the, the driver of what we do on the farm is really about biological diversity. It's so important. And the crops are, as I said earlier, really just a byproduct of, of this. Um, and it's beautiful. I mean, why would you want to destroy that, you know? Um, but it will eventually get mown, <laughs> which is a shame. But when I mow it, I leave strips unmown because I don't want to kill everything because it, mowing will do some damage to this insect activity. So we leave strips unmown and they'll get cut next time, so we alternate. We never cut a whole lot in one go, it gets cut in different stages to in encourage this biological activity to remain. Are you all right, Charlie? Or? Yeah, it's just a walk as close to you, Right, move on. Cornflower here, I mean, this is just one of the wildflowers. The wildflowers didn't do very well this year because what happened, they all tried to flower in the winter and it was very warm. They were all trying to fly in December and January, then the frost came and finished them off. But normally this, this would be, you know, a carpet of wildflowers. Um, there's about 20 species, but I've never managed to find more than 10. Some of them never seem to work. But this is something we've reintroduced, and this flower would have been here hundreds of years ago. Mm. And we just brought it in really to try and replace what, what has been lost, because we just feel that this diversity is really important. This will have specific insects that live on it. There might be a particular caterpillar lives on it you know mm. but we've also got two rare arable weeds none of which I can remember well um fluellen fluellen round leaf fluellen yeah which we haven't seen for yeah. a few years it's disappeared it's yeah there. well we left it in we, yeah, we stopped hoeing it when we discovered yeah. it was rare yeah. then it took over yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will come back it's really this is the other thing about rotation every year you get a different weed you know so every crop will favor a particular weed which is fine we don't have a problem with that at all you know so you can see the weeds change as the rotation goes through. It's not just about fertility, but it's all about keeping those weeds in the system. So Fuelin will come back at some point. You have a field madder as well, which excites yeah, we have field madder, that's right. Yeah. yeah. We've had quite a lot of... I mean, this farm of ours is one of the most heavily surveyed farms in the country, probably. We've got all sorts of data emerging. We've got lots of trials going on. Um, there's been a couple of flora surveys done here. And there, I think there was 65 species of flower and plant at one point in the survey. That was only done once. So, I mean, if you came back every month, you'd get different things. But I think it was 75 species, which is pretty good for a field which is in permanent sort of cultivation of horticultural crops, which is actually quite demanding. Horticulture demands a huge amount of soil um, fertility in order to maintain it. You know, horticulture is very demanding on soil structure because of lots of movements of soil, lots of traffic, lots of different crops, lots of changes. Uh, whereas arable farming is much less demanding. So to encourage, to see that we've got this very high population of wildflowers is really encouraging. It makes us think we are doing something probably about right. Yes, and there's pink chicory as well. Yeah, interesting genetic yeah. variant, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So this is the same, this is year, this is actually year one. These two plots are year one of the rotation. And we're going to look at the same, which is year two. All right, so the next plot is year two. So that's been in for longer. You can see the difference. The flowers, the flowers are much thicker in the second year crop. The chicory this year is fantastic. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Because if you come in the afternoon, it's all closed up. Yes. It all goes in. Yeah. At a very specific time, I think. So this has been, this was mown in the spring. Um, you also, you can hear this some days. It's not so good today, but some days you can hear it buzzing with activity. Um, these two plots, this is year two of the rotation. 
one of these is actually a trial plot but we're, we're looking at compost application so what we're applying here as part of the rotation we're doing we apply wood chip compost and uh, that goes on twice during the two years of green manure so year one it goes on and year two it goes on it's about 70 cubic meters per hectare which is that thick it's a very small amount it's not much at all that's enough to sort of stimulate the biological activity and, and, and bring in brings in a lot of carbon the earthworm population at this point will be very high and we've got earthworm counts going on we've got wonderful people who come here and count earthworms twice a year um, and we've got figures of around 10 to 12 million per hectare which in terms of one square meter is about 1200 per square meter so if you were to dig up that much soil from one square meter you get 1200 earthworms it's a staggeringly high figure and i've worked out it's equivalent to probably about 15 tons so we're stock free we have no animals but hang on we've got 15 tons an acre of, of earthworms which is far more you'd have if you had cows wandering around so we do have livestock we have a lot of livestock it's in the ground it's working the ground we've also got rabbits and deers running around but you know they're, they're less of a issue for us um, so the earthworms are a really important contributor and this green year is all about developing biological systems and the earthworm is the is the king of that really because the earthworm can really show us how good or otherwise our soil is if our soil is in a difficult situation the earthworm population will drop if the soil is really healthy and it's full of activity and lots of organic matter and loads of carbon the earthworm population explodes and that's what we're seeing in the last few years and the wood chip has made a huge difference. The wood chip has really accelerated our earthworm population. Not only are they counting the earthworms, they're also analysing or assessing which, which species there are, because I didn't realise, but there's loads of different, it's not just one earthworm, it's 22, I think. Is it? I could say dozens, but no, it's yeah. not quite dozens. It <laughs> might be 22. Lot. I think it's 22. Yeah. It's not odd. And also, they're also looking at the age of the earthworms. You think, well, you know, why would you want to know the age of the earthworm? Because actually, the age of the earthworm could give, give you a really good indicator of what's happening in your soil. If you've got very old earthworms, it shows they're not reproducing. You've got a load of old geriatrics. So what's going to happen when they die? Well, nothing. They're going to die out. So the essential point is the ratio of juveniles to adults is really important. So there is a healthy population if you've got the right ratio of juveniles to adults. I mean, this is getting very technical now, I know. But actually, I don't quite understand the figures, but apparently there is a, a magic ratio of juveniles to adults, and that shows soil health. So what we're looking at on the farm is not just how much crop we grow, it's also about soil health. And we're kind of measuring and coming up with <clears throat> formula and easy to carry out and analytical processes to assess what our soil is doing, where it's at and how healthy it is. And we're seeing there's some really interesting stuff coming out of this. Um, you know, farmers need to be able to go on their land and, and do simple tests to see how good their soil is or isn't. So we've been developing these farmer easy uh, approaches to assessing your soil quality really. And it's not about chemical analysis although that can be helpful it's really about biological observation <clears throat> as much as anything and um, you know we're seeing some really interesting stuff coming out of that so the green manure is part of that whole process so this was in squash two years ago next year this goes into potatoes this goes into year one uh, and when we go across the other side we'll look at the potatoes but you'll see how well they grow after this mm. it's incredibly good crop really staggeringly good crop right we'll move on to the very last two plots which is squash which is year seven all right so this is this is the last year of the rotation uh, this is year seven so we've, we've been right through we've grown a whole range of different crops prior to that last year in here we had carrots and parsnip and celeriac and beetroot they were all cleared in the winter uh, now it's the squash broad beans they were sown uh, in the spring a bit late we usually try and do them in the autumn but it's too wet um, the, the ground was cleaned up, so we cleared the weeds and the crop residues, um, had a stale seed bed, and then we planted the squash, which Romney raised in the greenhouse. So it was, well, we didn't quite get to 2,200, but I think we got about 1,900. <laughs> uh, we were a bit short for various reasons, some problems with germination. And, you know, it's incredible how this grows. This, these were just small plants two weeks ago. This has all been sown with green manure, and it probably hasn't come up yet. Oh, yeah, it has. It's just coming up. You can see the little plants here, little seedlings coming up. This is all green manure. So this is going to grow into what you see over there. So this is what I call relay 
green manure. And this is something I've pioneered. No one else ever dared try this out before. Um, and we've had some failures, of course, but you know, we've been doing it in squash now for 20 years. We know it, it's never failed. It's always worked, you know. Um, but it is a bit tricky because you have to get the crop in at the right time. You have to sow the green manure at the right time. You have about three days to do it. If you leave it too late, the plants get too big. This is all done by tractor. So all the work here, apart from the actual planting, has been mechanised. And you'll see they're all planted on a square, so you can cultivate in both directions. And that's essential because this is a big area to hoe by hand. So it's all done by mechanics. There's been no uh, hand work here at all. And these will carry on growing. The squash will get very big. They'll be touching between the rows. The green manure will grow underneath. It won't get very big. It will be quite small because the plants offer a lot of shade. I mean, some of them will completely cover the green manure, but they'll be there. When the squash die off, which they'll start to by the middle of August, early September, they'll be dying off. Then the light gets in, the sun can get to the plants and the green manure starts to grow again. So the green manure is well established. If we didn't do it now, we wouldn't be able to do it till next spring, which means this would be bare in the winter, which is bad news. I mean, bare soil is, is not good at all, you know. So particularly this soil type, because this can, this can flow quite easily if, with, with water. So the idea is to keep the ground covered as much as possible. And this green manure, which includes all the clovers and the trefoils, also has the wildflowers. So next year, this will be doing nothing. But when I say doing nothing, it's actually doing the most important part in the rotation, which is fertility building long term. So we're building fertility now for the next two years, which is going to keep us going for five more after that, without bringing anything in, apart from a bit of wood chip compost. Same over here, this is all squash. We've got different varieties. You can see some already flowering. That's the uh, Halloween pumpkins flowering already, really quick. They've only been planted for three weeks. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a picture of health, actually, when you look at it. I mean, you know, this is 33 years of continuous vegetable growing um, without any inputs at all, other than green manures and, in the last 10 years, wood chip. Um, you know, and, and this shows what you can actually do on, as you can see, on pretty poor quality ground. You can actually hear this soil. When, when we're cultivating with machinery, it has a sound to it. And as you go out the field, the sound changes because at the top it's, it's pretty, almost stone free, it's beautiful. As you come down, it gets more and more noisy, you know. We have a steerage hoe, uh, which somebody has to sit on the back. You've done it, Charles. You, you've heard the noise. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite noisy, isn't it? Mm. So it's very noisy soil. <laughs> I call it noisy soil. Um, the soil between the stones is actually really nice, but it's the stones that kind of degrade it, really. And if it weren't for the stones, it would be probably grade two land, which would make it a whole lot more attractive. Uh, to other people, I probably wouldn't have got it. So, uh, so in a way, it's kind of fortunate. The stones actually do have a benefit. They also help to drain it, and also they ensure it warms up really well in the spring. It, it soil warms quickly. We have the earliest potato crop anywhere in Oxfordshire here. It's really early, so it's not you know it's not the best soil in the world, but it's it's doable. I mean, what it does show is you can manage quite poor quality soil. You can make it fertile, and you can make it productive. It doesn't have to be top quality land. OK, it would be easier if it was. If you get grade one land, it would be easier. But it's not essential. We can still do it. Our yields might be a bit higher, and slightly lower cost. This is rough on machinery, this stuff. Yeah, rough on your... Say, yeah, it's really rough on machinery, you know. <laughs> rough on your hands as well, you know. Uh, but it does produce a crop on land which really, in, in official terms, is not classed as, as even arable land it's grassland or tree land that's that's the classification it's grassland or tree land it's not even cereal land although it did grow cereals the year before i came here it wasn't <coughs> it wasn't very good uh, this field in total is seven acres um i say each year of the rotation is just under two acres the trees they're coming on nicely they're going to be part of the whole system so some will be coppice some will be pollarded we'll be collecting wood from there for some for firewood some for wood chips a lot of it will end up back on the ground so this is going to be our long-term <coughs> support for wood chip um, applications. It's going to come from these strips, a lot of it. Not all of it, a lot of it. And also the hedges we can manage also for wood chip. Uh, we've got a shelter belt there, which I planted about 15 years ago, which is coming on quite nicely. It's to reduce the wind speed, but also it's to increase the, the biological diversity. Right, we need to go move into the other field before we run out of time. Yeah, we've got an hour. One, one small question, yeah. Tom. At what point did you did you sow the, the green manure here? Was it, it was before you put the pumpkins in, was it? No, the squash were planted first. Yeah. <coughs> the squash were here for maybe three weeks. 
the greener gets sown at the point when the squash is suddenly just about to grow crazy which is last week so it's a quite a critical if they get too big because some of these are trailing varieties you can you can see how this one is trailing now once they start to trail they, they grow at that speed very quickly i mean they grow that much in a day wow. every plant's got at least one ladybird on it already wow. so i mean you know this proximity to biological diversity which we have in the tree lines is really important because it means that insects can move in every now and again we create an absolute desert you know mm -hmm. barren desert because we turn the ground over and there's nothing growing here for a while this is really bad ecologically it's really bad you know but we've got these places where insects can retreat to and they can move back into repopulate you know kind of regroup and move back again and this is the importance of having these strips at very frequent intervals it's not like we've got it every half mile it's every every 25 meters and it's really important if you go to these large arable farms who will talk about you know what they're doing for biodiversity they have a, a two meter strip every half mile across the field and they think that's going to put it right you know they think that's well that's all they're prepared to give up i had a group of arable farmers here a few years ago and they were looking at this saying oh a lot of land you've given up here you know you got you got four meters every every 25 meters how can you afford to give up all that land i say how could i afford not to because this is my biological diversity this is what keeps all my pests away this is what generates the the biological function of what we do i cannot afford not to have that piece grow okay we've lost 15 20 percent of our land but we've gained in yield you know our yields have gone up as a result of doing that so you know it's very short-sighted to think that putting land into biological diversity is a loss it's not a loss it's not a production loss at all it's a gain it should be if it's done properly so this integration of biological diversity i think is essential and a lot of farms do it as a bolt-on extra it's not integral with the whole system and it's having that whole system approach which is so important it's not enough just to plant a few trees in the corner of the field and think that's going to do your biological diversity a lot of good because it doesn't on its own it has no purpose what hardly any purpose whatsoever all this needs to be connected up and it's this interconnectivity of the hedges the beetle banks and even the strip we leave around the field uncut we leave a, a one meter piece that doesn't get cut that's to encourage biological diversity to increase the, the wildflower population because it gives a, a bank a reserve for insects to go so when i do create this desert as i have done here you know for six weeks this is empty of anything you know it just gets cultivated to control the weeds um you know biodiversity can move back really quickly and you only got to look at the squash everyone's got a ladybird on already so we know it's working you know insects don't want to move very far they like to stay close to protection right we're going to go across to the other field so the first attempt was okay until a volunteer dug it up and put it on the compost heap um <laughs> this is what happens um the second one was in the other field which is slightly wetter than this field it has slightly higher clay so it doesn't drain so well in the winter and asparagus hates wet feet and this is not the ideal soil for asparagus but here it's slightly lighter it's a bit stonier it's like sandier so we thought maybe it's a chance uh, Lynn grew these uh, four years ago from seed uh, we only cropped it properly this time for the first year Zoe did all the picking didn't you was it 35 kilos we picked yeah it's pretty miserable mm -hmm. 35 kilos from 150 meters it would be better next year but this is the fourth year we're still waiting to get our money back <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and we may wait you know quite a few more years in fact if it suddenly starts to die in three or four years time we won't get our money back so there is always a kind of risk factor in everything you grow the bigger the, the longer term the crop the bigger the risk you know like apples we've got apples here in the tree lines um this year will be their first year well that's five years we've been waiting luckily we didn't pay for them because the um, woodland trust donated them as part of our agroforestry um, work uh, so we were very lucky to get them donated but we've had to do all the work so there's been a fair bit of labor gone in and they they will start to pay back in time it's a really useful addition to to what we grow also so fantastic dye stuff yeah lovely mm -hmm. dye stuff yeah apparently <laughs> um look at it just sitting there i know hand signs flashing up before my eyes the big difficulty <laughs> with asparagus is keeping the weeds down <laughs> so we're using wood chip for that so it gets mulched every year and uh, the white clover we, we're mowing this really to keep it quite short we don't want it competing too much with the asparagus at the moment uh the wild strip here is a beetle bank which will have to go quite soon because the trees are creeping in and limit how many trees you want in this field 
So it's going to get mowed off, which is a shame because it's got a fantastic range of flowers in, but it will come back. Uh, we've got orchids it's in there. It's been changing every yeah. year. Every year's well, different. Hasn't it? Yeah, the beetle I've banks change them. every year. We've got, mm. I've just got rid of one that had been in for 25 years, which was a shame, mm. but it was too many elders and, yeah, and brambles that it had to go, it. you know. Yeah. Um, but we'll start again with yeah, that. Yeah, that one is, yeah. Nearby on the boat. Uh, he works just around in the immediate area, he doesn't travel far. So most of this comes from within a, a five mile radius. He tends to be, if he's working nearby, he drops it off. So we don't pay for it. Um, we could actually charge him to dump it here because if you took it to a local dump, he'd have to pay, which is why he brings it here because we don't charge him. Um, it can be all sorts. We get a whole mixture. This has got some Leylandi in it. Uh, sometimes it's pine. We don't want too much pine and Leylandi because it can upset the process, but it's usually about right. It's usually about 25% uh, coniferous and the rest is deciduous. I don't know what this one was. Um, we've had quite a bit of ash lately because a lot of ash are coming down because of side back, so we're getting ash as well. Now that's, um, I think that's the Burnham. <laughs> we get all sorts of strange things. It get, gets dumped here. Um, every sort of couple of months I get digger and I row it up and I build this windrow, mix everything up. So it all gets mixed up. So the process starts here and this will heat up. If it gets damp, it will heat up. As we go down, it gets older and older. And I'm just, I'm due to turn this again now. We've got a digger coming next week. So I'll be turning all this again. Eventually, once it's finished, which you can see down here, it will go back onto the ground. This is sort of near enough ready. In fact, it's, this is good enough to spread on the field. The problem is we've got a lot of spuds which need composting again, you know. Um, is, that, is that quite warm? It's about 55 degrees still. It's still quite warm, so it's still processing itself. And that would go on the field. That's perfect for field use. We don't need it completely broken down. Where we're using it in the garden, in the tunnels, we might leave it a little bit longer. This is less than one year old. It's probably about nine months old. Um, the pile underneath the tile pool is much older and that's stuff which is more than a year old which we've put to one side and that's going to go into the gardens that's going to be used for plant raising so that'll be what Romney uses next year for plant raising it needs to be much more broken down because we don't want bits of wood in it not too much it has to be sieved so the older it is the easier it sieves so this is our main carbon build if you like it's not just the green manures the green manures don't build huge amounts of carbon but this adds a lot of carbon to the soil and, and we apply it to the green manure crop only. We never put this on bare soil, apart from in tunnels. But um, outdoors, we never apply it to bare soil. It only ever goes on to green manure crop because the green manure crop can process this material. This is biologically very rich. Lots of fungi, lots of bacteria. So it's a really, it's a really useful product. And yeah, we've got another crop of spuds there. Um, we need these for the ground in just a, a few weeks here because it's so warm. You know, this gets very warm. You can get potatoes growing here in the middle of winter. Uh, and we have used some of the heat for plant raising one winter. We had a go at raising plants on, on this in, in January, which worked really well. And that was when it was minus 15 degrees. So this is very much a part of the, the, uh, the fertility building of the farm. And as I say, it goes on within the rotation. We don't just chuck it on bare soil. It always goes on green manure crop. So if there is any wood, you get bits like this. Um, if you turn that into soil, that will rob nitrogen for a long time. But if you leave it on the top, it will disappear by the action of earthworm. This is still very much carbon. It needs to break down into more simple, usable forms that the soil can digest. If you put too much of this on, you cause lots of trouble. So if it goes on the surface, it doesn't do any harm. Squash, that's only been there about two weeks. Uh, that will flower and produce some odd looking squashes because it's not true. It's a cross of something. You know? Right, we're going to go that way. Heavily influenced by spaghetti, presumably. Yeah, the spaghetti squash often get into the <laughs> genes of these things, you know? They, they have that shape, yeah, but yeah. some horrible colour. Nasty yeah? torpedoes. Yeah. yeah. So any, um, all the vegetable waste from the packing shed, I mean, this is a bit of stuff from the, from the shop, I think. Any waste comes back here as well. That gets, eventually gets mixed in, uh, mixed in with a whole lot. So it's a, it's a mixture of wood chip and and green waste but the green waste is really a very small part of the total it's probably less than uh, it's not even 10 percent by volume uh, anything we take from the tunnels when we clean out like tomatoes when they finish in in november that will come down here that goes on here as well 
everything, weeds from the tunnels, that also comes here. So it's a really useful place for composting. Cardboard boxes, they come here as well. So it's a great way of getting rid of all our organic material, processing it and applying it back to the land. So nothing really gets wasted. Why is there a difference between the tunnels and the open field? The open field you leave everything, but in the tunnels you don't. Well, in the tunnels, because we're going to get another crop in tomorrow, right? We clear it away. In the field, we don't have the same pressure. Because the tunnels are so valuable in terms of their <coughs> um, productivity, um, you know, we need to clear the ground quickly. So we'll pull everything out or we mow it off and then turn it in. Whereas in the field, we don't, we're not under that same pressure. So this is, um, this is quite, it looks relatively old, but it's only been here about three weeks and it's already started to break down it's quite warm but it's very dry because it's been in the summer this stuff doesn't compost well it composts better in the winter when there's some moisture and it will stop doing anything it get hot and then as it gets hot it dries out and it stops working and then it will get turned it will start again so the turning process is really important to, to speed up the process it would rush on its own if we just left it in a pile but it would take three or four years and we haven't really got three or four years to wait um, and also by mixing it, we mix different tree woods together. If we had separate piles of conifer and deciduous, it wouldn't work so well. We need that mix of different materials to get a more even uh, homogenous product. So in the course of a year, we, we produce around 150 cubic meters. Uh, and that's enough to do the two plots in the rotation, year one and two, <coughs> and some that goes to guard and some that goes for plant raising. The actual amount for plant raising is quite small. It's probably only about six or seven cubic meters a year. Um, so it's a very tiny part of this. Which is, which is quite difficult, but it kind of much better for soil not to plow deep. Uh, and then the potatoes were planted. They're planted from seed, um, most of which we buy in and go at seed, but we do save some ourselves. And they're all varieties which are resistant to blight because blight is a big risk in, in organic production. We don't have any sprays. So they're blight resistant varieties. And then the sweet corn has been sown in different batches. So what you're looking at here is four different crops. It starts over there, it's the big one, which is about to flower now. An and then we've got a slightly smaller one and smaller again, and then the ones which is just coming up. And each crop is three weeks apart because each sweet corn crop only does three weeks and then it's finished. So we don't want all in one go because there'd be too many. So the idea is to have four different sowings. The last sowing may not work if we get very poor October. It may, it may not produce much, or if it does, it won't be very tasty, so it's slightly risky. Uh, the first one sometimes doesn't work either because it might be too cold. So, you know, we, we keep sowing until we get it right. Uh, this year, I think we might get four crops. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, it's usually three, but this year we may get four. It's looking really nice looking fantastic because it loves going in after green manure it's had loads of fertility um, have a look so the first eight rows are separate from the other there's a gap there where the seed drill ran out um, this is the thing we use the machinery you don't want to know what's going on when it's behind you um, these are all just about to come into flower the fence is to keep the bashes out because they'll slaughter everything they'll be in there now before it's even made cobs. They eat the stems, the sugary stem, they eat a lot. Um, this will be under sown. It should have been done by now, it hasn't happened yet, but this will be under sown with the green manure. It'll be an overwinter green manure, so it'll be here until next spring. So it's not a, a permanent green manure, it's a short term green manure. All this will get under sown. We've got a couple of rows of experimental of courgettes. I've never tried courgettes in the field, and they've been sown direct. So I put two seeds in, uh, they all work pretty well. Um, so it's a bit of a trial really to see if it's possible because it's, it's much less work than plant raising. And also it gives us a later crop. And then there's more sweet corn beyond that. And this has all been done by tractor. We have seed drills on tractor, um, apart from the courgettes, which I, I did by hand. So it's, it's sort of semi-mechanized. Um, and the first crop of sweet corn probably be ready in about three, four weeks probably, it depends on the, it's slowed down now because it's gone cool and damp and overcast, but probably about four weeks from now. We usually get the first corn around the first or second week in August. This year might be slightly earlier, so we'll, we'll see, you know. It's the thing, you never quite, you can't predict this, exactly this science. <laughs> it's not a science, it's not, you know. You never quite know what's going to happen, but yeah, maybe in about four weeks. Spuds. So this is still year four, the year three of the rotation. It's the first crop in the rotation. 
Uh, there was about 20,000 seed put in there. This is such an easy job, it's unreal. You wouldn't believe how easy this is. I mean, once you've got fertility, the rest of it kind of looks after itself. There's been no hand hoeing there. There's been one very quick hand weeding, which, did you do some of that? Mm, it took half an hour. It took half an hour. That was it, and it was pulling docks, yeah. a few docks. And that's the only job that's been done by hand. I think we did it for you, so. Yeah, we've done, a, we've done a pass over the You did a pass as well, so there was two passes, yeah. about half an hour each time. Yeah. Well, add that to the, the five hours I've spent, six hours I've spent on the track, that's all it took. So the ploughing, the power hiring, the planting, and the inter-row cultivations, which I did on my own with the tractor, was about, no, it's about seven hours work. That's all it's taken so far. The big job is picking them up. You know, this is the easy bit. Now we've got to get them out. If it's anything like last year, it's looking like it might be, but you should never count the chickens fully hatched. But it looks like we may get a similar yield to last year. From this area last year, we harvested 27 tonnes, which was a staggeringly high yield. It really was. Even by conventional standards, that would be good. Um, so if, if, if it was only half that, I'd be okay with it. You know, that would be all right as well. So we might end up with, you know, 20 odd tonnes of potatoes here. Uh, we've started digging them. We're getting 12 sacks to a row, I think. <laughs> I think it was 12 or 16 or something. Um, the white one here isn't actually quite ready yet. The red one has come earlier. We've already taken six rows of earlies, which we started in May, which is the earliest we've ever harvested potatoes. And now we're on to main crop. This is a variety we haven't grown before, so we're not sure about this one, but they're great big fat white things, aren't they? Have you seen them? Have you had a look? I'm going to pull one up. They probably won't come out very well. Wow. And if you, if you think it's been raining, look how dry that is. Look, <coughs> dry soil. And everyone, everyone tells you it's been raining all week. No, it hasn't. You know, it's been damp, it hasn't been raining. These are due for irrigation because they are getting very dry. That's not all of them, there'll be a few more in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, and that's the edge, the edge one, which is often not the best one anyway. Um, they are a baking variety, but you see this? This is called little potato, right? No, this is, this is a physiological dis disease, well, problem. It's called little potato. It's because of the, the dry weather, they started to sprout and that will grow another little potato. And that detracts from the quality of this. So this is a problem. This is why I have to water them again, yeah. because it's dry. Um, there's another one, oh, that's the, that's the stolen. So even with irrigation, I mean, they've been irrigated three times this year, which is more than I would normally irrigate. Um, even with irrigation, uh, we're still getting some problems because of the dry weather. This soil uses a lot of water. It's all stones. It doesn't hold water. But, you know, it's a, it's a good crop. It's so how do you water them? Uh, we've got a huge big irrigator, which does all this in two goes. It's a big boom sprayer. Uh, where is it? Oh, it's right down the end of the field. <laughs> um, we have a borehole down there and a pump. We've got a diesel pump. And we're shifting uh, about 250 tonne a day water. It's a quarter of a million litres a day, which sounds a lot, but actually not that much, really. So 200 tonnes, that would do these spuds. And that has to be done, if it's really dry, it has to be done every, at least every 10 days, possibly more often. Depends on the temperature. I mean, if it's really hot, a lot of that water will disappear almost as soon as it hits the ground. This is the problem with irrigation, is that you lose quite a lot to the atmosphere. Ideally, we'd do it at night, um, but I can't because neighbours will complain there's a tractor running all night. And also, there's, you know, there's, if things go wrong, I'm not around middle of the night to deal with it. You know, irrigation's a lot of hassle, it's a lot of work. Um, it doesn't take long to set it up. I can set this up in half an hour or more, and then you, you have to keep coming back and checking it. So it's something you don't do until you really have to. But without irrigation, we wouldn't have this. You know, given that we only had two millimetre of rain in the whole of May, that's two millimetre, that's that much. Whereas this crop needs 75 in May. We didn't put 75 on because that's a lot, but we, we put 50 on. So we're not even irrigating up to the capacity that perhaps conventional growers would. Conventional growers would have irrigated this twice as often as I have. So we're not really irrigating for maximum yield, uh, primarily because We'd have to check, well, it's complicated, but we'd have to change the, the road distance. Everything would have to change. We'd have to have different tractors, they'd have to go further apart uh, to get the yield. We can't do that because it conflicts with other crops. So we kind of settle for a, a reduced yield, 
which means reduced irrigation. If we irrigate too much, we'll get green potatoes like that because they'll start to push out the side of the, the ridge. So, um, you know, it's a fine balancing act in, in putting enough water on to keep them healthy and not regrow, uh, or too much that encourages big potatoes which end up green, which you have to chuck away. So, it's, I think we might have hoed them. Did you hoe them once? Uh, no. no, these haven't been hoed. Yeah, somebody hoed them yeah. quickly, yeah. But most of the work's been done with tractors and they're, they're pretty clean. But you know, from now on, I don't care about the weeds. The weeds can grow from now on, it's not really an issue, you know. Uh, we'll start harvesting those quite soon, really. I mean, they're almost, well, they are ready now, but I think we'll get a little bit bigger because it would be a bit of a shame to, to get them at this size. But they will be ready in, in you know, a couple of weeks. Um, we've got more over there. We've got another 20,000 to plant out yet, um, bare roots. Uh, and then next to that we've got four rows of red onion. We've been trying desperately for about 20 years to grow decent crop of red onions and this looks like it might actually happen. Mm -hmm. now, red onions are really difficult. Um, even if you manage to grow them, they don't keep very well, they often go off very quickly. So this one is supposed to be a good keeper. Well, we'll, we'll see uh, what happens. But this is a, a variety we haven't grown before. So we're hoping it's going to work out. Um, so these are all from, from modules. This is what was normally raised in the propagation house. Uh, your babies. They're now sort of in their teen years, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're not you know, just mature. Getting yeah. stringy. Yeah. Um, and then we've got more leeks, which were raised in a seed bed. So do you never get leek moth? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, leek moth. Now, leek moth is a, is a relatively new pest which has come in with global warming or climate change, whatever you want to call it. <coughs> um, it turned up here, it turned up in the south of the UK about 15, 20 years ago, and each year it moved about 30 or 40 miles north as the temperature increased. By how does this work, George? I don't know. Maybe it, it is as the temperature goes up? I don't know. Uh, yeah, or it just gets yeah. used to our shitty climate? Yeah, no, it just increases its range. Yeah. yeah. So it's been increasing and it landed, it turned up, I mean, I heard about another farm before it got here. It turned up here, uh, I don't know how long ago it was now, it might have been about eight or nine years ago. So we were kind of waiting for it, really, because everybody had been telling these horrible stories about leek moth. Sure enough, it turned up and, and there was quite a bit of damage in leeks. We had to trim them quite hard. The second year, the damage wasn't anything like as bad. The third year, it was almost unnoticeable. By the fourth year, we never saw, we never see it. And the reason, I think, I don't know this for sure, I'm only guessing, but I think the reason is that the predator has also moved with it, or one of our predators has, has adapted to dealing with this new pest. Because we don't see a problem at all. And this has been uh, a case with many other organic growers I know as well. They've also not, you asked about leek moth, oh yeah, we used to get leek moth, oh, yeah, we don't get any more, what happened, I wonder. And I think the predators moved, the leek moth is still around because conventional farmers have a nightmare of it. But there's another leek pest now, onion. Onion. We got leek moth really badly in the garden last year, never seen it before, no. and suddenly really, really badly. No. So it'll be interesting to see whether we get it this year. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, I've just never seen it like that, but but we hadn't grown leeks in the garden yeah. before, so you maybe it was the, the first. Leaks, exactly, see? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah. you posted on that one. So it's all about, <laughs> again, you know, we're back to this, this, this need of biodiversity. You know, we've mm. somehow, we've, by accident, we've developed the predator which lives on leek moth. You know, I don't know what it is even. It'd be interesting to know what it is. It's obviously, it's maybe not even just one parasitic wasp. It's probably dozens of different types, you know. We, we have them for brassicas, now we have them for leeks. So it's really useful. It'd be interesting to see what happens because there's now also leaf miner, um, leek onion miner. No, hang on. There's another new onion leak disease, uh, pest rather. Um, I forgot what it's called now, leak moth miner or something. It, bear, it, it, it has a different action. So we'll see if that one turns up this year. You know? I mean, you've got these constant threats and every time I hear a threat about a new pest or disease, I think, oh yeah, it never comes to anything. And they don't, they never actually come to anything. I mean, like, there was this big scare 30 years ago about New Zealand fl flatworms which were going to destroy all the earthworms in the whole of Europe. No, it didn't. It is a few pockets here and there, and they do eat earthworms. But, you know, if you've got no earthworms, they are going to destroy your population. If you've got 10 per metre, they will destroy them. If you've got 1,200 like we are, they're not going to eat that lot. You know, it's not possible, you know. So, you know, it's about the balance of nature, which is so important, it really is. And that's something we're continually learning about all the time. The more I learn about it, I realize, I realize how little I actually know. You know, there's so much to know about this subject. You need to be slightly better than an amateur 
entomologist, I think, to really understand what's going on. And I have a, just a very, you know, very glancing interest and knowledge about what goes on in the insect world. But it's a fascinating world, it really is. And, you know, we, we rely totally on insect for most of our pest control. We've yet to find an insect that controls pigeons. Uh, uh, but maybe one day. So we've got more leeks here. These were grown in the seed bed. Each row is 800 leeks, so it's quite a lot. The big job with this is the, is the harvesting. And this will go on. I mean, we start harvesting leeks in a couple of weeks and they go right through till the end of May next year. So it's nearly the whole year round. The end of May next year, so it's nearly the whole year round, and it is hugely labour intensive. And it's no more labour intensive here on a small farm than it would be if you worked on a, you know, 2,000 acre vegetable farm somewhere down on the you know, down in west of east of Berkshire, where they grow huge areas of leeks. And it's all done by hand. It's a hand job. There is no machine yet which they've developed which will cut, trim, grade, and put a leek in the right place. It hasn't happened. You know, maybe one day it might, but at the moment it hasn't. So it depends on huge amounts of labour, which is, you know, the problem the, the conventional vegetable growers have at the minute is they, they're running out of labour, you know, because of COVID and other, other things. They've had serious problems getting crops harvested. Um, it's the same for us. We, you know, we, we face the same problems, but it's on a much smaller scale, so we can deal with it. So the rest of this is, uh, it's been, it was green manure until about two weeks ago. In fact, all, all this was in green manure from the winter. Uh, and it was this section here was green manure till about two weeks ago. I just turned it in recently, and that's in preparation for more leeks, which we have in the garden. They'll be planted out quite soon, and then there'll be a few rows of spring onions sown at the very end, which will give us a crop of onions. If it works, it never has yet, but it might do this year. Uh, next spring, uh, we're going to try and do it earlier this year. Beyond here, we've got French bean. Well, it's blotty bean. This is my uh, rather minuscule attempt at growing a protein crop. Um, it's just, it's for fun really. Uh, yeah, Belotti beans which we're allowed to dry, so we harvest them dry. And I'm, I'm, we're getting a bit better each year, it gets slightly better. We've done it for four or five years, but some years it doesn't happen at all because of the weather. This is quite a risky crop. So if we get really damp August and September, they don't ripen properly and you can't harvest them until they're dry. Well, you can, but you know, it's a lot of work. They have to go into a dry building. This is a crop really which suits really arable farms better than uh, vegetable growing farms but yeah we did last year we did harvest about we ended up with 150 kilogram of dried beans and we put them in very small packets and charged quite a lot of money for them so it sort of covers the cost just about uh, but it's not really something we consider to be a, a money-making exercise it's really something which adds some variety to what we have in the veg shed and also something to add to the box scheme during the winter when we start to run out it's really useful in sort of in the early spring when we're running out of fresh green crops you know so it's a kind of a novelty crop really rather than a serious crop but it shows promise and it's kind of useful to know that it could be scaled up to something much larger beans are a really useful crop because they fit really well within rotations because they don't need nitrogen they have their own so it's a really useful crop in that respect and i mean i must say they're looking absolutely fantastic this year they dry on the plant <laughs> they're just starting to flower you can see the flowers just starting to come now. Um, you only get about sort of 10 beans on each plant. Uh, and in a, you know, in a proper arable rotation, they would be closer in the row than this. They would be half that distance apart. I've, I've done this because it suits our weed control system, but in an arable system, they would be much closer. So the yield would potentially be higher. But, you know, they're a really easy crop and they have got similar sort of chances of success as soil would be in this country so it's, it's kind of marginal it's not a guaranteed crop you know in six years we've only really had three decent ones last year's was the best actually this year they went in early the earliest we've ever planted them so because they were sown early the chances improve so it's about the sowing date i mean previous years we couldn't you can't sow things like this until soil temperature gets to about 12 or 14 degrees and I'm measuring soil temperature because I can't sow this or sweet corn until we get to that temperature. And this year we got there earlier than we ever have done. Some years we, we don't get there till June, which is too late. So it's really about soil temperature. A lot of people don't realise how critical soil temperature is. If I sowed these at 
sort of temperature of 13, 12 or 13 degrees, maybe only half would come up. So it's quite critical. If we wait to get to 14 or 15, all of them come up. It's that critical. One or two degrees makes a big difference. And also, it was dry. If it suddenly rained, then your soil temperature drops and the seed rots. And this is how critical this is. So it's not, you know, it's not a crop full of faint-hearted and it wouldn't work every year. If you're in eastern part of England on sandy soils, you have a better chance than you have here. This is not the ideal place because the soil is not sandy enough. But yeah, it's a useful crop. Uh, beyond here, we've got a beetle bank. These two beetle banks were sown about four or five years ago. So they're starting to kind of change into something else now. A lot of the original material I put in is no longer there. There's still some, but it's changing. There was originally 20 odd flowers and there's still 20, but they're different flowers. You know, they're, they're, they've changed. The wild carrot seems to be taking over in places and the chicory uh, loves, loves this site. Chicory loves it here. They're both, they're both the same, they're both the same mix, but they've now got different flowers on each side. If you go and look at them, there's, there's a variation from one to the other. So, you know, things develop differently, even though it's only three metres between them. The, the grass bit here is a, is a road that takes us down to our irrigation. We have a borehole which I put in down there. So the irrigation is from uh, groundwater, which down there in the winter is at ground level because the River Thames comes into that field. So we're just we're literally on the edge of the floodplain and occasionally down that end of the field it does flood where the trees are which I planted for that reason I planted this willow because of flood that goes underwater most years in fact this year it was this deep underwater so we have a borehole there into the into the chalk the water table um, and we have a license to extract that for irrigation and we have a pipe running the whole length of the field buried underground it comes up here goes under the road into the next field. So we have a, a complete system of irrigation, which we wouldn't be operating this field without the water. It's quite, um, this is a really, you know, we're in a dry part of the country. It's not like you guys, you get 40 inches a year, you know? <laughs> we only get 22 inches on average, and that's half the rainfall we get in Manchester, um, and only half a number of days as well. Although it's been raining every day for a week, but only like this amount. So it is, it is dry, and we would never be able to operate this as a, as a financially viable unit without some form of water input. Right, um, this is year six of the rotation, which is all by the last one. So next year is going to be what? Right, this is all root crops. And we, we put these towards the end of the rotation, really, because root crops are not hugely demanding of fertility. And our thoughts, our original thoughts were that fertility would decline as we go through the rotation. The further we get away from the long-term green manure, the less fertility we would have. And that's what all the sort of soil boffins would tell you and all the people that have done work on farms would tell you that. And we believed it, but actually it's not true at all. <laughs> uh, what we have found that when we get to the end of the rotation, we have just as much fertility as when we started at the beginning, which actually is really encouraging because it means we are able to maintain fertility right the way through rather than having huge peaks and troughs of nutrients. We're not we're not in this situation where we've got massive nutrient one year and none the next. We're keeping it pretty level. However, it's in the end of rotation. Uh, it's at a point where there might be more weed problems because the weed problems build up as you go through the rotation. Um, and it's, it's prior to squash, so it kind of works quite well. So we've got leaf beet and chard. There was two rows of spinach, which we only picked once one week because that's about all you do pick spinach for in this country it gets too hot we picked it for one week um it's now being cleaned up and i'm going to drill uh two rows of um perpetual spinach in there which is much easier to manage and then this is our second sowing of carrots you saw the first one in the tunnel these were sown quite early in april earlier than i would normally sow them because the soil was warm remember i told you about soil temperatures it affects carrots as well so we were able to get an early start this year which is a big help actually these are ready now, although we don't need them just yet. We're still using the tunnel. They'll carry on growing for another week. Um, they'll be pulled by hand. Carrots are really difficult because of weed control. They don't cover the ground well when they're young. They're really slow to get going. Um, they're not an easy crop to grow. Um, sometimes we'll flame weed them, but we didn't with these. Um, we've done a bit of hand weeding, I think. Yeah, we've done a bit of hand weeding, not too much. But the rest of the weeding has been done mechanically. And then we've got beetroot. Um, this is something you always end up growing too much of. So I've, each year I try to grow less, but we still end up too much. Um, 
we've been picking this for probably three weeks now and it doesn't look as if we've touched it um you just go through and pick out the big ones and go back again the following week and there's more big ones you just keep doing that eventually they get heady and end up this big um which we can sell you know we can get rid of big beetroot i mean one of our problems we have is vegetable sizes you know because most people don't want big beetroot well this is what supermarkets tell you actually it's, it's rubbish because they don't mind actually i mean in the winter we had enormous parsnips i'm not exaggerating they were this big that long they were a kilogram each huge great thing there's no way any supermarket even entertain such a thing you know it doesn't look right on the shelf it's too big but we put them in the vegetables and people bought them you know so it does it they do sell themselves i mean some people will always pick the small ones because they think it tastes better but that's actually not true so you know we have a range of different sizes which suits you know, a range of different customers uh, beyond here we've got celeriac This was all done from seed. Uh, this is another one of Romney's little jobs. Um, was it 2000? I can't remember. I think it was 2000. Oh, no. yeah. Maybe it's a bit more than 2000. So Celeriac is incredibly difficult to get going because it's really <coughs> slow. These were sown in the middle of February. And we won't start harvesting them until October or November. That's how long it takes, you know. It's a slow job. It was 28 modules, trays, because it was a whole... Yeah. Yeah, my 77 time table is not that great. <laughs> <laughs> it's over, it's 2,400. 2,400, rough, yeah. give or take 100, yeah? 2,400, and we still have 2,400. Unlike last year, when very unusually, more than half of them disappeared through slug activity, or we think it, we never really did get bombed, but half of them did disappear. Uh, and then Romney, bless her, grew some more and we planted them and then Francis, bless him, managed to mow them off uh, with the irrigator one day that went completely crazy it, it went and lost them all journey. and <laughs> had to be salvaged out of the mud and replanted. They had a really bad time. They did make it in them but they were small. This year, you know, you should never, I tell people, never count your chickens but actually they do look really good this year. Uh, they love this sort of weather, damp and cool. This is their climate really, damp and cool. If it goes dry, we have to irrigate pretty regularly because they hate dry weather. It's a bog plant. It lives in bogs. Uh, that's where it does best. So, Slayer, and then beyond that, we've got parsnip. These were drilled direct. And uh, 12 rows. Uh, we're trying to not go for one kilogram each parsnip, so we've drilled them much closer this year, trying to get size down a bit. Um, there's two varieties there. The first two rows is my own seed from 2017. We had a bit left. Uh, I put them in just to see how they do and they've done really well and the rest is fresh seed uh, they've been steerage hoed by machine that's the person sat on the back the big hoe okay, doing two rows at once um, and then in time I'll be ridging them up all the crops in the foot end up on ridges eventually uh, beyond that we've got uh, chicory Uh, a bit messy. We've got two rows of chicory. This is for this is another experiment. You know, you should never really do all these experiments. They're horrendously expensive and they often go wrong. But I, I can't help it. Mm -hmm. So we've got two rows of chicory. They're going to be the big roots. They let the stuff be grow in the green manure, but it's a cultivated type. So we're going to dig them up in the autumn, well, early winter, and then we're going to force them on the compost heap. We're going to put them under covers, uh, and you get this white called chicon. You see chicory, horse chicory. It's like a thing like that. They're uh, wickedly expensive, I hope, because uh, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. But we're going to use the compost heap as a source of heat. So that's going to be our big sales point, yeah? No fossil fuel used in growing these. Um, completely uh, natural heat from our own sources. So it's a experimental. Um, they've just started to grow. The pigeons love them. I don't know why, because they're incredibly bitter. But the pigeons love them, and they got completely hammered. For the first three but now they're growing faster than the pigeons can eat them so they're catching up and they will grow they will get huge they love the soil so it's a bit of a experiment beyond that we've got fennel uh, a bit thin at the end of the row here but as it goes through you can see it's on a couple of nice rows of fennel this is also a trial i've never drilled fennel direct in the field i've got quite um ambitious i suppose you could say with the seed drill what i can do in the field because we would normally do these as, as plants which you saw in the greenhouse but we're doing it in the field which is if you get it right it's much less work it's, it's a fraction of the time to do it it does rely on really good weed control that's the critical 
pipes, keeping the weeds down. Before they even come up, you have to weed control. Uh, beyond that, we've got there's six, eight rows of carrot, which I'm probably going to write off because it's too weedy. There's too much weed. We didn't get the seed bed right. Uh, we didn't flame weed them before they came up. So the amount of time we're going to make an assessment, or I am going to make an assessment in a few days, the amount of time to weed that by hand may be far more than the value of the crop. So we're right off. I've drilled again. I've done more, more sowing. So there are occasions when we write a crop off purely on, you know, I have to make very difficult decisions sometimes about the economics of this business. And, you know, if that's going to cost more to weed than it's worth, there's really no point. We're better off without it. You know, it could end up with six people here for two days to do that when everything's not getting done. So, you know, I may write it off. I've yet to assess it. But if it takes more than two hours per row of hand weeding, it goes. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, but I've already drilled it and we're going to get it right we're, we're flame weeded so occasionally we use flame weeding as a means of weed control particularly with carrots and parsnips we've done this is pre-emergent flame weeding so just before the crop emerges like the day before before it germinates on the surface we flame it very quickly and that kills all the this is a technology we've had for 40 years we developed it 40 years ago with some other growers and it works really well if you get the timing right if you get the timing wrong you kill your crop uh, it relies on the fact that most weeds come up before carrots and parsnip, so you, you kill the weeds. In the idea where what we do, we have a stale seed bed first, uh, and that's repeated shallow cultivations, and then drill into that. But it doesn't always work sometimes because of weather. So more carrots have been drilled, and I've got more to, more to drill. I'm drilling, which as soon as it dries up, I've got another 16 rows to drill. We end up with about 30 rows of carrots, uh, which this is why you can't hand weed carrots. It's 30 rows of hand weeding is a huge job. So we've got to get this stale seed bed right. Beyond there we've got beetroot again. Uh, we've got uh, the beetroot over there is cylindrical beetroot. It's long, thin ones which are really nice and easy for preparation. These are round ones. One is a red and white stripy one and the other is just a red one. Um, we like to have different varieties because it keeps people interested. So they were drilled, uh, direct drilled just uh, well, two weeks ago, barely two weeks ago. We've been through once with steerage hoe the other day. Uh, we go through again. Uh, we weren't expected to do any hand hoe or hand weeding on that. Beach is really easy because it grows fast. And uh, a bit of soil ridging up will control the weeds in the row. And once they're established, they look after themselves. It's really, it's such an idiot-proof crop, a beetroot. This is why we end up with so much of it. Because they look how many there are. I know. <laughs> and, then, and when they get to a decent size, they'll be touching all the way down the row. There'll be a continuous row. They'll be touching the whole length of the row. But you see, compared to the garden, our rows are twice as far apart. That's the difference. So we make the difference in the row. We put them really close to compensate for that loss. Because it is a lot of space. I mean, look at carrots. There's a huge amount of room between the rows. Although it doesn't look it when they grow big. Why so much room? We control. Oh, okay. I mean, if we had very sophisticated equipment and stone-free land, we would be growing three rows in a little bit, a little bit wider than that, but it'd be three rows. So everything's to a modular unit. Everything's to a model of 700 millimetres because the tractor's 1,400 millimetres. It's all it's to fit the tractor. Everything fits the tractor. It's all the machinery is the same width for the row work. There's 10 or 15 different bits of kit for up and down the roads for different jobs. It's all like ancient stuff from, you know, from the 50s, most of it. There's nothing new or very little. Um, so it's to make better use of the machinery, really. That's why the row is that far apart. Really difficult. The closer the rows go, the better the equipment you need to control weeds. And you can't do this by hand. It's too much, you know. I mean, we've got, in total, we have, um, it's 58 kilometres of row, so it's about 35 miles in total. If you added it all up, all the rows, it comes to about 35, no, it's nearly 40 miles, nearly 40 miles of row, right? So it's from here to Newbury and back again. You know, you imagine hand hoeing that. <laughs> He's thinking about it. <laughs> the bit you've done is quite a small area, really. <laughs> um, you know, this is. And, and we're small scale, you know, this is small scale production. I mean, some people got a thousand miles a row on a farm, vegetables, you know, it's horrendous, really. Um, beyond here, we've got more carrots that have been drilled and, and more to be drilled. And then uh, by, well, we're in a 
two weeks, this will all be full up, there'll be no space here. There was green manure here up until three weeks ago. This was only just recently cultivated. Uh, the last plot, which is year four of the rotation, is the brassicas. So last year we had potatoes down here. <coughs> right, this is all, all brassicas. Uh, so we had potatoes here last year, it's green manured right through the winter, right up until the time we started planting these. So these were planted in uh, April, about the middle of April. And yeah, middle of April. So we take an out trip to green manure as and when we need the ground. So I usually do it about two or three weeks before we actually need it, give it time to settle, clean it up. Um, the cabbage has got really hammered by pigeons initially. Um, and then we had to crop cover them. So the crop covers are to keep the pigeons off. That's what it's there for. Uh, we've planted a whole lot of stuff over there. The trouble with crop covers is it also encourages other pest problems because you're keeping predators out. So, and this year we had a big problem with mealy aphids because it was very hot and dry. Uh, we had crop covers on, no predators, so you know they got hammered by mealy aphids. So we had to take covers off, and then the birds came back again. The mealy aphids disappeared. The pigeons came back. So we had a bit of a rough time. Everything else is okay. Um, everything else is now growing faster, and the pigeons can eat it. But you know these got suffered badly. Um, so there's two rows of cabbage, and then we got two rows of. Um, coral rabbi, which I drilled direct, so this is sown, these were plants, these were sown direct, so Romney raised the plants, I sowed these direct, it's coral rabbi, which is now sort of that size, looking, we've never done, first time I've ever done it direct, so it's an interesting experiment, and then kale, that was sown direct, and then there was four rows of seedbed, which was brassica, winter brassica, which we planted over there, we pulled them all up and planted them again, and then we got Brussels sprouts, Everything here is for winter, apart from the first two rows of cabbage. These will all be ready from sort of, well, the Christmas. They are a variety which is primarily for December and January. You know, different varieties have different time. Uh, this is one of the few hybrids we grow. We, we prefer not to grow hybrids. Uh, this is one of few. We cannot get an open pollinated variety which actually works well. It's just rubbish. Doric, yeah, Doric. So we've got eight rows of Brussels sprouts, there's about 900 plants there. Then we've got Colette's. You all know Colette's? New crop, new vegetable, invented about eight years ago. Uh, and it's great that people still invent new vegetables, you know. Um, apparently the breeding program took eight years to come up with this. Really? Yeah. It's a slow process, you know. Nice. So Colette's, they are absolutely fantastic. Um, they're one of the most satisfying crops to grow. They, they grow enormous. They're going to be this tall. Wow. And it's a cross between Brussels sprouts and kale. Uh -huh. So it's like a little, um, every leaf knows you get a, a, like a sprout, uh -huh. but it opens up into a kind of a flowery thing. These little tiny kale leaves are beautiful, absolutely fantastic, really nice to eat, really tasty, dead easy to cook. You just chuck them in, steam them for a few minutes. Easy to pick, you know, grows quite easily they get all the potentially all the cabbage pests but we don't really have too much trouble with that yeah a really a really decent crop and uh, we've grown it now for I think probably five years we were one of the first organic farms to try it out probably um, yeah everyone was able a lot of people grow these now they're really popular great crop really easy to, to sell just the price of seed yeah the price of seed is horrendous <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a thousand plants there and that, well, we had to buy it twice, didn't we? Because we had a bit of failure, didn't we? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Each seed, and they're tiny, each well, seed. Good quality, yeah. uh, hang on, how much was each seed? Um, it's 150 pounds a thousand. So each seed is 15 pence. They great. And they weren't great. I mean, it doesn't sound much, 15 pence for seed, but you know, we bought one and a half thousand of them. You know, it's really expensive. Whereas Swede, you know, you get, you get a million for that money. You know, it's completely different. They're really expensive. They are, and they're not hybrids. Mm. These are open pollinated. Yeah. I've since yeah. discovered. Really? Yeah. I didn't realise that. Huh? Well, I thought they'd mixed all the different hybrid varieties together, but no, it's open pollinated. Okay. So we can save seed. Well, that's interesting. If we've grown yeah. up. Because it was, it, it obviously just had a hard time last year. 
Well, the seed was rubbish, and I should have complained, yeah. which I didn't. <clears throat> you tend not to complain about the seed because there's other things yeah. to complain about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was pretty. It poor was just quality. visually not. You, you know, you look at it and just think, oh, that's A lot of them were broken great. as well, yeah. weren't they? They were yeah. split. They've been badly yeah. harvested and badly graded. Yeah. I, think. I mean, it might have just been the conditions that they were gathered. So yeah, the price of seeds for some things is, is quite high. I mean, the most expensive is cucumbers, which seventy pence a seed. Wow. wow. Yeah. One seed. Yeah, one seed, seventy pence. But they're hybrids again. Why, why, uh, is that why you don't like some grown It's not just the price, it's more about, well, it's several things, but firstly there's, you know, they have total control over you uh, in terms, because you can't grow from, from them, you can't save seeds, there's no potential for saving seeds. And also the, the, the upsurge of hybrids has meant that open pollinated varieties have been neglected. There's more money for seed companies to produce hybrids, you know, there's much more money in it for them. And the open pollinated ones, which are easier to grow and are much higher yielding in terms of seed, have been neglected and they haven't maintained them as true varieties. So the quality of, of that variety has gone down because the, the hybrids are taken over. So that's one of the reasons for not wanting to have hybrids is the fact they are neglecting, you know, the conventional varieties. Uh, it's a, seed is a complicated story and it's a difficult job. It really is. Growing seed is really hard. I mean, if we wanted to say seeds from these we'd need to leave at least 40 or 50 plants you know and we have to leave them until now in the field so they're going to be right in the way so they'll be right in the middle of the onions i tried it this year i did leave some they, just had, they had to go because they were right in the way you know and now we have a weedy mess there instead you know it's really difficult you know growing seed uh, your own i mean we do some we do some beans and we keep some potatoes and we have a, one variety of tomato we grow every year for seed but it's really complicated growth I mean squash we can't grow with it too many varieties so seed saving on farm is actually a very very difficult thing to do properly you end up with poor quality so we kind of let the, the specialists do it and end up paying the price and, and, and I don't actually mind paying for seed to be honest you know I mean it's good value I mean 15 pence a seed but you know we got a pound or two pounds worth of crop there on each plant so it is it is worth doing Beyond here, we've got more kale. We've gone with a lot of kale this year. Kale's suddenly become really popular. Uh, and these were plants that were grown in, the, if you remember in the garden, we had a few rows of kale in the yeah. tunnel. These were grown there. You remember these, don't you? Yeah, we them. They were grown there. We, we grew them in a the seedbed. We harvested it all. We picked it all one week, put it in the pot scheme, and then we pulled them up and put them down here, uh, which means they'll do much better because in the tunnel, they don't really do that well, particularly in the summer. Um, and they'll continue. These will crop right up until probably April next year. So it's a really good long-term crop. You know, it's really quick. It's only really planted it was about three weeks ago, it? three or four weeks ago. Yeah. So it's a really quick crop, and we've already we have started harvesting again. We've taken quite a lot this end. These two here were planted a week later, so we haven't cropped them yet. There's, there's a pick in there now. And then we've got two more rows of cabbage. This is a seed bed. These are going to be pulled up and planted over there where we've got a few rows empty. And the rest of this right up until almost the end of well, the two crop covers. This is all cauliflower. And there's uh, four varieties here which gives us a spread of production from, well, depends on the weather, but hopefully from the middle of October through to about Christmas. But that can go completely wrong, <laughs> depending on the weather. I mean, one year we had some in Christmas that weren't meant to be ready till April, you know, because it was too warm. So you're never quite sure. But ideally, you know, they will give us a spread of crop over pretty much most of the winter up to Christmas. Beyond that, you can't have cauliflower because it's too cold. They freeze. So, you know, if we get heavy frost, we, we could lose this. But we haven't had much frost damage on cauliflower for the last decade, really. It's, it's quite unusual. So it's slightly risky, but not as risky as it was. Um, these are all hybrids as well. See, most of the brassicas, we cannot get decent open pollinated brassicas. This is where most of our hybrids are. The sprouts and the cauliflower. And that's about it. And one variety of cucumber and two varieties of tomato. The rest are all open pollinated. So yeah, these are looking really nice. These were only planted, uh, well, Romney grew these. These were modules. Um, these were only planted just over a week ago. We've been through the steerage hoe once. Um, they've just started to get established. The birds have left them alone. Uh, we could probably risk taking the other covers off now because they're 
once the plants are established the covers come off we only keep covers on for probably well hopefully no more than three weeks because of the problem of other pests becoming an issue and uh, then beyond there we've got some winter cabbage which was the seed bed over there so in total we've got um i'm trying to make a rough estimate we've got about 40,000 plants here which have been raised either as no, it's about 30,000. Either as bare root transplants or as modules. And then the rest is drilled. We've still got to drill some uh, white, no, some black radish. Uh, we've got some sweet down there drilled. So this is everything for the winter, really. This is our kind of winter. I mean, most of what's in the field is primarily winter crops. I and mean, we, we do start some now, obviously, but it's mostly for winter storage. You know, the potatoes we store, the squash we store, we'll get probably, depends on the season but we will get at least 4,000 squash and last year we had nearly six um, and then we'll have the potatoes there'll be the parsnips and carrots so it's all what we call winter winter fodder really and it's you know it's the backbone of our business in the winter you know we don't have so much in the garden we only have the tunnels in the garden because the rest of the garden is tied up with green manures over winter and then we have the tunnels which are mostly cropping during the winter with, with salads so it's all filled up with salads what time is it we need to get back for lunch yeah, yeah. We need to get back for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>
until you actually see how this works in in the in the real world, um, it is quite difficult understanding the whole process of running a commercial farm. Because as I said earlier, it is very much about taking sometimes some quite difficult decisions about things, and you have to accept that um, your 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 private your private social life will pretty much disappear. You won't have one. Um, and I, I mean that doesn't. You know that suits some people really well. You know, and they're the ones that usually make relatively successful growers because you know they're not out pubbing every every second <laughs> night um, because they're busy watering and tending the tomatoes. I mean, you 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 have to give up quite a big chunk of your life in order to make this work. I mean, this may not be what everybody wants to hear. This is the reality. You you do have to make some quite considerable sacrifices in in the commercial sense unless you have huge amounts of capital to start. If you've got huge amounts of capital, the whole thing's a whole lot easier, it really is. I mean, if you can start out with, you know, brand new polytunnels, new machinery, um, get everything you need uh, and pay um, someone who's, who maybe has some experience, then, then, then it's relatively easy. Um, but that isn't usually the case for most people. Most people do this, as I did, scale up from, you know, I started as a gardener, scale up and, and realize that actually this is what you like doing. You sell a few letters to people down the road and, and gradually the, the business grows from that. And now we're selling 140 tons of food a year to, to people in the local community. Um, you know, we, we have had to stick at it for a long time. And at the moment we're having, we're having, um, we're having a real bonanza. I mean, the, the present situation has been incredibly beneficial to us and we are selling everything we can the di most difficult part of growing is not the growing it's the selling the selling is the hard part uh, and that's always been our biggest challenge really in the past has been sales not the growing is relatively simple once you've had the experience it's quite easy to grow veg once you know what you're doing it takes some years but the actual marketing is much more difficult and you know we're only successful because we market everything direct to, to the customer if we were saying to third party, this business wouldn't work, we wouldn't be viable. So the economics are decidedly um, marginal, to say the least. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I, I cannot think of anything I would have rather been doing. It, it creates tremendous um, sense of well-being and goodwill, particularly at the moment when everybody's clamoring to get our produce. It's a, it's a great it's a great thing to be involved in. And. For me personally, you know, I've moved beyond just the farm. I have I, I have an interest beyond the farm. And that's something which you also need to maintain. I may have said, well, you give up your social life and everything. But no, you, you have to keep something and you have to have an interest outside of the farm and try and maintain it. So that, that is quite important because farms are 100 percent, potentially 100 percent consuming. They absolutely take you over. There's no question of that. So having a, a, another interest somewhere else is really quite important um, and experience gaining experience of course is, is critical so I hope that doesn't sound too negative you know I mean there's there's so many positives in this I mean I'm not a particularly financially rich man in fact anything but I don't even own a house I don't own my land our farm is rented we're, we're tenant farmers we're landless peasants um, but I have I have riches beyond beyond any monetary value I have riches here on this farm which you cannot put a price on absolutely priceless Yesterday we had a staff meeting. We had all seven of our staff, well, seven full-time staff. We have part-time as well. And we had a fantastic uh, staff day where we had food and uh, even the drink at the end of the day. Uh, we did a bit of a farm walk. We kind of talked about maybe what we would like to be doing in the future. We got people's independent ideas. And I came away from there thinking, you know, I am one of the lucky people in the world to have such a, a, a fantastic group of people around me. And this has only happened because I've been growing vegetables um, for all that time. So for, for us, it's a, it's, a, it's a great life. And I would strongly urge anybody who's really keen on vegetable growing to, to do it, really. And now that we understand organic and, you know, lastly, in the last 20 years, um, stop free or veganic, um, that's put a new dimension to what we do is, is kept my interest in what we do because uh, you know we see this as a, a real way of, of, of um, improving the, the, the standards or the, or the chances the planet's got in the future to be self-sustaining in terms of food production we know we can produce huge amounts of food on you know relatively small areas of land using virtually no inputs whatsoever you know there's no other form of agriculture can do that 
and, and nothing has suffered in the process. So, you know, we're, we, we're quite passionate. All of us here, all our staff also share the same view. We are really passionate that you can grow food without livestock and feed loads of people in a really nice way. And that's really, I think, one of the main things that's, that's, that's kept me going. Um, I was recently asked what my retirement plans are. I just, my retirement plans carry on. Uh, I don't yeah. have I don't have a retirement plan. I, well, why do I want to retire? You know, retire from this? No way. You know, um, and, I mean, behind me on the wall here are just some of the pictures that some of our visitors and staff have, have left me here. You know, I mean, people just bring stuff because they love what we do. So I think, you know, to grow in this way, um, you know, in a vegan way is really is the future it really is i don't see any other way of going forward i really don't in terms of agricultural production i think this has got such potential and even if it's just one acre you're doing it has a huge standing in the local community and it can serve as a really good example to other people so i, I think even if it doesn't really pay that well there's so many other reasons to be doing it brilliant thanks Dolly. Hi Tolly, if I was to start a small box scheme in South Wales, UK, what would you say are the most profitable profitable crops I could grow here on one acre with the largest polytunnel, about 100 square metres on it? So yeah, 100 square metre polytunnel, so that's um, what square root of 100, 10 by 10. Um, yeah, that's a relatively small polytunnel uh, and one acre. In that scale, you, you really need to be thinking very high value crops, of course. Um, and that inevitably really means you have to be thinking primarily salad type leaves. You know, there's 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 a lot there's a lot more value in salad leaves than there are in say cabbages. So it's gonna be relatively high value. So you know, one crop would be a diverse mix of salad leaves, and that would be partly comprised of some brassica and some non-brassica varieties um most of it would be outdoors the polytunnel is is very small in 100 square meters is is a very tiny polytunnel by commercial standards so some of that polytunnel would be used for plant raising you're not going to grow a huge amount of crops in that area given the fact that it is very small the other crop which is high value but um is interesting that the highest value crops are also the most risky um, so potentially they could be really good, but potentially they could be big losers as well. I mean, strawberries work really well in small areas, um, and strawberries are potentially very high value. I mean, we, we you know we produced over twenty thousand pounds worth of strawberries this year from um, just just over half an acre. So you know they are they are potentially very valuable. They're also potentially very stressful uh, because you've only got three or four weeks to sell them but they do sell really well strawberries sell really easily this is this is the the beauty of a strawberry crop is it's a very easy crop to sell whereas vegetables are not not as easy you can sell a lot more strawberries than you ever sell cabbages for example uh, because it's something people can eat straight away so strawberries would be would be worth considering um it does take a bit of investment because you have to have stock um, and the downside of strawberries really is, is weather. They can be quite weather dependent. So if you've got good weather, you can have a really good crop. And we had fantastic weather last year. We never had lockdown. Uh, we had people to pick them because nobody had any work. And we have fantastic weather. I mean, that's the perfect, you know, the perfect situation to have. It doesn't always work that way. But strawberries do have <coughs> quite, a, <coughs> quite a good earning potential on a small scale. It also opens up potential doors for marketing other produce if you if you start people off on strawberries because they are one of the first crops of the year um you know you can then win them round to buy other things um for the future but so strawberries mixed salads uh things like fennel fennel are, are, are really easy to grow if you've got the right site um you can have quite a long season um they would go quite well with the salad packs as well um and then other sort of quite high value crops would be um, outdoors um, well lettuce I mean lettuce are always a good standby they're not hugely valuable but you know you can you can grow a lot in a season because you can double double crop on the same piece of land if you've got good fertility so you can get two crops from one piece of land even three uh, occasionally if, if the weather's good so they have they have quite good quite good potential a lot really in terms of 
profitability a lot depends on having that direct link with your with your customer um you you have to generate direct marketing you cannot do this in any other way so you know the bot scheme which i think um has been mentioned is is by far one of the best ways of getting through to through, through to the customer things like um <clears throat> potatoes carrots onions not worth growing they're they're, they're too cheap uh, you have to have much higher value crops um in the in the in the tunnel which is quite small but tomatoes take some beating in terms of value they are they are high value crop they are relatively easy to grow you can get quite good yields um and cucumbers also but given the size of the tunnel which is very small it's not really practical to mix cucumbers and tomatoes in the same tunnel they are they need completely opposite treatment in terms of ventilation and humidity so cucumbers and, and tomatoes in the same tunnel not a good idea but tomatoes on their own really good but you have to have a rotation so you can only grow tomatoes in the same place one year in, in four or five so you have to have other crops to go with that um but yes it's um it's never easy recommending the best value crops to grow in a small area because so much does depend on the way the crop are to be marketed but direct marketing is obviously absolutely essential and again a lot depends on the soil on the soil type you need to know you need to know your soil before you even venture into what you may wish to grow on that particular site but strawberries are they are pretty reliable if you're lucky with the weather you can you can cover them over in, in times of extreme inclement conditions so they do have potential and they are a great way of, of opening up your, your customer base really Nice one, thank you. Uh, and the second part of that question was also, what should I avoid because they're too much trouble for the value? <clears throat> well, I think I probably mentioned that. I mean, potatoes just don't bother growing potatoes. Um, you know, they're a hell of a lot of work. You know, for, for a pound a kilo, why bother? Um, it's, um, it's it's quite, you know, it's a very small return for a crop. I mean, we, we grow 25, 30 tonnes a year, and for us, it's it's one of our better paying crops because we, we've mechanized it. We don't really do, apart from harvesting, there's very little hand labor. Uh, but on a small scale, things like carrots, onions, potato, staple crops are not worth growing on a small scale. They, they have no value hardly at all. You know, we, we, we managed to produce on an acre, perhaps a uh, 20 ton of potato, which is an exceptionally high yield, and that's worth about 20,000. Um, this is about four pounds a square meter. You know, and that's a really good crop. So, you know, four pounds square meter, um, if you've only got an acre, um, you need to be thinking in much higher value than that. So staple crops are not are not worth growing at all. Uh, things like cauliflower take up a huge amount of room. I mentioned our cauliflower we lost two and a half thousand quid's worth. Um, you know, that takes up an area of land which is uh hundred meters long and, and twenty meters wide. It's it's almost half a a quarter of an acre, over a quarter of an acre, nearly half an acre. So it's quite a big piece of land, and that's that's worth yeah. two and a half grand. So it's a relatively low value crop. You need to grow quite a lot of it to make it work. So staple crops are definitely out. You need to go for higher value, salady type crop. Spring onions are okay; they they work quite a bit. Um, and the salad, all the salad leaves are high value. Fennel, um, celery, if you've got really good land, you can grow celery. That's quite a good crop to grow as well. Um, so you are aiming for mostly leafy green crops rather than root crops are definitely not, not really valuable. People do grow them on, on quite small scale, but they often grow them primarily to make up a rotation. And this is the other thing about choosing your crops, you have to think about a viable rotation as well. So sometimes you end up growing crops which are not particularly valuable just because it, it occupies a space within the rotation to make it a viable rotation. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tommy. This is quite encouraging, actually. Mm. And, you know, some quite uh, well-known people have sort of started to get involved in this. So it is, um, you know, it is quite heartening that this is beginning to take place. And in a way, this is partly due to COVID again. I mean, everyone talks about all the negative stuff about COVID, but there's also a lot of very positive stuff as well. The fact that I'm here now today is really as a result of COVID. We, we wouldn't be doing this uh, otherwise. Um, you know, we wouldn't be doing this online presence. I wouldn't be reaching out to anything like as many people as I was. I mean, we do a lot of farm walks on the farm. Uh, last year, I only did four. The year before, I did 40. Um, 
but you know and that's quite hard going actually um but you know each farm walk there's only about sort of 10 or 20 people at each farm walk i can sometimes do an online presence such as this and get to 100 200 or even more people um so we're able to reach out potentially to more people it's not quite in the same way but i think there is some real benefit in this uh, technology which we're sort of getting used to now and feeling less embarrassed about using uh, and, and getting better at dealing with it. You know, people have nice backgrounds now, I see, um, <laughs> uh, rather than uh, their shabby bookcase with, with dodgy <laughs> publications in. Um, so, um, yes, uh, there, there is increasing interest in, in, in what we're, what we're what we hope will become a, a more normal way of, of, of agricultural production. And, you know, we hope with the new government uh, scheme for supporting agriculture, there'll be more opportunities for people to give up livestock in the future. Absolutely. I, I know you, you do consultancy for helping people with that. Um, if anyone's got any questions or, or wants to take you on as a consultant, how would they contact you? What would be the best way? Uh, the best way is by email. They can do it through our website, tolerancedorganic.co.uk. If they go to our website, there's a facility there. They can contact um, the office at the farm, and, and then the, the farm will send it to me. So that's the best way. And I send out forms to people to find out a bit more about the farm and what, what they would like to do with it. So that's the starting point, really. So, uh, yes, if anybody wants to go to our website, they can email from there. Brilliant. Well, I know I've learned a huge amount today, so thank you very much. I'm going to be watching this video again when it's all been tidied up and everything. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully sometime. Yeah, and thank you very much for putting it on. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Tony. Good night. Thanks, Holly. Take Bye. care.